Thank you for listening to Salam Gateway. You're listening to our interviews with Islamic economy people from the Global Islamic Economy Summit that was on October 30th and 31st in Dubai. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Salam Gateway. Um, we have with us today Dr. Muhammad. Welcome, Dr. Muhammad. It's nice to see you in Dubai, the Global Islamic Economy Summit. Uh, thank you, and it's great to be here. Dr. Muhammad, um, you work with a company in the United States called Kensai. That's K-E-N-S-C-I. Is that right? Uh, that is correct, right. So I work for Kensai, which is a health informatics AI-based uh, company applying, uh, applying machine learning and AI uh, for patient risk within healthcare. And is that your area of specialty, AI? Uh, that is correct, right. Yeah, so that's my main area of uh, research. And I also teach uh, at uh, University of Washington, uh, Tacoma. Okay. Um, Dr. Muhammad and I were talking uh, before we started this recording, and he was telling me about how he is in Dubai also to speak to a, a local Islamic bank about the fiqh of algorithms. Um, and that sounded really, really interesting. So I, w I wonder, Dr. Muhammad, if you could sort of give us an introduction as to what exactly that means? Uh, sure. Uh, so the background of the problem is that uh, so for the first time in human history, we are deploying uh, deploying these large these machine learning and AI systems which make decisions on behalf of humans for humans, uh, which, which at the very minimum can affect the quality of life of people and even in some cases matter of life and death. So the canonical example of that is to think about self-driving cars. Uh, so a number of companies are already working on creating self-driving cars. Uh, so think of a scenario where say, uh, where, say, there's a passenger in the car and there's rain and the car is wavering. Uh, and so there are two pedestrians on either side of the road. So there's, a, there's an old grandmother and then there's a young child. So now the car has, uh, the, uh, the AI on board the car has to make a decision whether to make a right or left. It's either or. Basically to decide which person to save and which person to kill. Uh, so this is not a theoretical exercise. So this is what is known as the trolley problem in philosophy. So people in Western philosophy have been talking about this for the last 70 years or so. Uh, but with driverless cars, it becomes a real world scenario. It becomes an engineering problem. Now a person or a committee of people has to go and decide how do you code such systems. For example, um, say, uh, uh, for example, it has to figure out, um, say, should it, should it save multiple people? Um, or what if act the system actually has information regarding, uh, say, the criminal history of a one person of one of these people, and one of them is predicted to be, say, a repeat offender? Should it take information that into account in order to decide which person to save or not? Um, so this is where the intersection between uh, Sharia and um, artificial intelligence come into play. Who uses this? I, I know that you said it was a, 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 an Islamic bank um, that invited you to speak about it. At what stage of development is um, this theory or, or any practical aspects of it um, in the market, in, for example, in Islamic finance? Uh, so this field uh, is what is known as uh, FAT ML, um, so which corresponds to Fairness, accountability, transparency in machine learning, and I would say even in the world there are there are less than one thousand people who are working in this area in, in general. In terms of Sharia fiqh and no, in, no, in terms of just fairness just and accountability in right, right, correct, correct, and then people who are specifically working uh, at the intersection of say uh, fairness, accountability in machine learning and AI and Sharia. Uh, to the best my, best of my knowledge, it's a group of one. Um, Who's that? Uh, so yes, actually, I am like exploring. You're the only one. Correct, correct, right. So it's it's a very and the reason for that is that it's a very nascent field. Like even people within computer science and ethics com ethics communities, they have just started thinking about uh, these issues, and nobody has answers. So I think this this is also a ripe time for us, for the Muslim community, to be actively engaged in these discussions, and uh, not just from a Sharia perspective, but like the Islamic world, like has more than a thousand years of speculative thinking regarding what if scenarios uh, so I think there's a lot that we can uh, that not just Muslims but the larger community can also learn and use to inform in creation of these systems so if we go back to your driverless cars we're in Dubai where we've been talking about uh, driverless cars and driverless taxis etc so with what you know and with sort of the that scenario that you have set for us um, 
who to kill in terms of the driverless car. Applying Sharia and Fiqh into that model, what would be that answer for that car? Uh, so, it's, uh, so it's going to be a two-tiered answer. So one is that um, like we ha you have to put some value on the lives of people because we are dealing with algorithms with numbers. There's no way to ex escape that. Um, so you have to come up with an answer from the perspective of Sharia. But not just that, uh, you have additional complications regarding so different uh, madhabs or schools of thought within Islam, say Shafi'i versus Hanafi, may actually have different answers. So maybe according to the Shafi'i madhab, uh, the answer is to say one set of people, but according to the Hanafis, it's a different answer. So maybe, uh, I mean, when if we go this route, then it's possible that maybe um, it, the answer that you get in UAE, which follows a certain madhab, may be different from what you get in Indonesia. Do you, this is this is a very interesting dilemma. So what you're saying is that um, if this actually develops and scales, there's a potential for you to go out and buy a driverless car, um, according to Hanbali, Shafi'i, Hanafi, Maliki, or it, it being programmed into the car, and you can select. Is uh, this is this the scenario? That's one of two scenarios. So it's so you can either leave the decision to because again th there's not enough regulation in this. This is like really new. So I envision that it could be one of like, not just two but even three scenarios where say maybe the end user has to select uh, what uh, say system of ethics uh, ethics to choose. So that's one scenario. Another one is that is the manufacturer who decides and then. I think the more likely scenario may just be that the government will just mandate, uh, just to make things uniform, that we're going to follow certain uh, regulatory regime. And of course, in Islamic countries, it'll be conformed by Islam and Sharia. That, that has happened in the Islamic finance space, of course, where there are, um, in some countries, there's a higher Sharia board. Um, and then across the world, we have standard set setting bodies um, at the industry level and then at the uh, regulator level, for instance, the AOFI and the IFSB in Islamic finance. But it took a while for the industry to come up with these standards to be for most of us to use. So being a, a very, very, very nascent um, area, uh, which is what you're looking into, sort of the fiqh uh, of algorithms, what do you see is the future of this, uh, of your um, area of expertise, and how will this develop, you think? Um, so I think this is one area where a lot of work still needs to be done, uh, a lot of de debates which need to be settled. Um, that said, I, I, I do believe that we are at a very pivotal point in history, um, the 21st century. So we could not have these conversations um, on a practical level five years ago. And, and 10 years from now, uh, many of these systems would have been implemented or uh, would have started to go into production. Um, so these conversations are, I think, the time horizon is from now until the next few years. So that's one. In terms of where they are likely to develop, so my worry is that um, is that if you don't address these questions from an Islamic perspective, um, not even just from Islamic, but even from, say, cultural perspective, uh, say, the, if you ever to having this conversation in, say, in Confucian society, you'd get a di very different answer. For example, in China. Right, right. Versus, say, if you're doing having this conversation in the West. So the, look, going back to the example that I gave earlier, whether to save the grandmother or the child. So in more individualist societies like the US or Canada, the majority of the people do say that, well, save the child. Versus in East Asian societies, it doesn't matter whether they're Muslim or Chinese uh, or Confucian or Taoist or Hindu you're more likely to get the answer that it's, that you should actually save the grandmother. Um, and the thing is, at the end of the day, you cannot really say that one answer is necessarily uh, better than the other. It just shows the values, the ethics of that particular culture. So um, as someone who works in this field, who have you been speaking to about it and where is the interest coming from in terms of the Islamic world? Um, so I've started. It's, uh, so I've started this project. It's been uh, less than a year, I would say. Um, so I was like, mainly talking to basically these scholars who are who may be interested in uh, the effects of technology uh, on uh, effects of technology on the life the lives of everyday Muslim, for example, uh, and then just like large Muslim organizations like uh, say banks. Um, 
who would be interested in exploring these uh, implications because uh, say technologies like say fintech uh, cryptocurrencies um, and AI, and with automation for uh, coming out with machine learning and AI uh, these organizations would be directly affected by them and another area which is very uh, ripe uh, and, and there are a lot of controversy around is that is using AI and machine learning uh, in the criminal justice system. So in the United States, there have been there have been a couple of really high profile studies which have shown that uh, AI systems actually discriminate against African Americans. And they're in use right now. Uh, yes. So the, uh, uh, yes. So a couple of years ago, so there was a study done by this organization, journalist investigative organization uh, ProPublica where they showed where they got this publicly available data from uh, sentencing records from County in Florida and where they demonstrated that uh, for the same exact crime for very similar background in terms of the gender of the person gender age range history of misdemeanors the AI system whose job was to recommend uh, sentences or to basically rec basically give a score regarding how um, how likely is that person to reoffend. Uh, it was rating African Americans much higher as compared to Caucasian people, and it was also predicting at much higher rate that the African American person will reoffend. Uh, when in a lot of cases the opposite was was true. So the thing is, at the end of the day, algorithms are a set of rules, uh, just mathematics. They, uh, so the question is then, how can they be biased? It's because the data that's being used to build these models, this comes from historical data, and so there's all the already a history of discrimination against certain ethnic groups. Uh, it's not just the U.S., but in like many societies in the world. So if you use that data to build models, of course you are going to get discrimination. But now, the prejudices of the society, uh, which were people had in their heads. Uh, the danger is that it will be you will actually scale that and your computing systems which will be making a lot of decisions in the future they'll be discriminating against people and now not just that but people will be able to hide behind uh, algorithms and say well uh, algorithms are neutral when they're actually not lastly because um, regulations and standards are set by largely by government in a lot of areas or government bodies um, but the technology most of the time is, is um, engineered by private companies. So that's where people like you come in. Well, what's your interaction been with um, governments? I know you're here in Dubai the, at the <coughs> and being invited by the Dubai Chamber for the Global Islamic Economy Summit. Is that an indication that the, um, Dubai or the UAE government is interested in talking to you about your work and how they could possibly implement it in their technologies? Um, so I have started, uh, I guess, a couple of conversations around that. Um, that said, I think in terms of uh, dealing with many of these issues, uh, again, I'm mainly talking from the context of the United States because that's the, that's the place that I'm most familiar with. Uh, uh, I would say private organizations, private large private organizations like say Google, IBM, Microsoft. Uh, uh, and Apple, uh, they are invest investing resources in trying to wrestle with these ethical dilemmas and trying to ensure that uh, machine learning and AI systems are fair and balanced. So, I, I mean, I, I do have some hope with respect to that. And, and then within the context of UAE, I would say that, I mean, it's, uh, I guess, what, what the UAE and the Dubai government has accomplished in the last 10 years seems to be very uh, forward-thinking, uh, forward-thinking governance. Um, so I would, I would hope that that these are certain issues that they will definitely, uh, definitely think about. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. We're definitely going to catch up with you because it's quite exciting, um, a, new, a new area. Um, thank you again for joining us, and we hope to hear from you soon. All right. Thank you for having me.